We're talking about hydrogen today because of the current focus on hydrogen in both the Westminster and Hollywood government's climate policies, and because it's also the focus of the big energy companies. We're pleased to welcome the author and activist, Simon Pirani, as the main speaker. Simon is the author of Burning Up, A Global History of Fossil Fuel Consumption, and has written extensively about the future for hydrogen in a, sustain in a sustainable economy. He's also the author of a highly recommended blog, and Pete at some point will put the link to that blog in the chat. After Simon has spoken, we welcome Ishbel Shand, who will speak briefly on behalf of the campaign to save some, to save some Fittix Park in Torrey, Aberdeen, from the threat of industrial development, which is said to be necessary for hydrogen production and storage. Then we'll have the best part of an hour for general discussion. And I guess the aim of the meeting is to equip us with clear arguments we can all use to oppose the false assumption that hydrogen technology is the solution to the climate crisis. We'll be recording the contributions for the two speakers, but not the discussion. So um, over to you, Simon. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mike, and thanks for the invitation. What I'm going to do, I'm going to share my screen, I hope, with some slides and go through um, five uh, sort of points which will hopefully give us an overview of uh, hydrogen um, in the context of the climate crisis, which is a global crisis. Um, and then we'll be able to, in the discussion, talk about uh, an issue that I, I end up with and, and, and address uh, towards the end of this short talk, which is what sort of uh, actions and policies might be adopted by the labor movement, by social movements uh, to tackle this issue. So, uh, and I've got five chunks of uh, stuff here. At the end, I will put these uh, slides as a PDF in the chat. And if you're watching this online subsequently, we'll have them available online. Um, so don't feel you've got to uh, take in all the detail um, because like too many speakers, I put too much detail on the slides. So uh, here's the first chunk, uh, which is that um, climate policies have to address the fact that climate is obviously a global issue. Global heating uh, is something which will be uh, tackled uh, or not globally. And the context is that uh, government policies, including the UK governments, are leading us to disaster. Um, this graph is by uh, one of the climate scientists who spends a lot of energy trying to uh, get stuff out to the general public as well as to politicians. That's Glenn Peters. Um, if you look at the blue line there, that's the line that uh, fossil fuel emissions, carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel burning will follow if uh, governments stick to the policies that they have stated. Um, the yellow line is the gap between uh, the things that governments actually do, so the policies they've actually worked out and the announcements they make, we all know about that gap. Um, but the really scary line uh, is the green line, which uh, is the line that the emissions would need to follow globally um, if we were going to get to so-called net zero uh, by, in other words, where the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere is the same as the amount being taken out, for example, by uh, vegetation, uh, that's the line that would have to be followed uh, for, for uh, us to reach net zero by 2050. And you can all see how far, uh, how big those gaps are, how, how far away these policies are from uh, getting even close uh, to that line. And what we've seen, and particularly COP27, has been perhaps the worst 
conference of parties under the uh, International uh, Climate Treaty for this is an enormous uh, load of greenwash uh, explaining how um, <clears throat> policies which will shift uh, the oil and gas industry a few centimetres towards what needs to be done instead of kilometres um, as uh, dress these up as some kind of green uh, policies. Um, net zero itself, in fact, well, it's a perfectly valid uh, scientific concept, but that itself has been spun uh, to uh, suggest that we can keep the industry and the economy can keep putting loads of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and that some clever engineers will come along and take it out at a later stage uh, with a lot of technologies that basically don't work. Um, and hydrogen really is part of this uh, greenwash. So what I'm going to, what I, what I would argue about this, this global situation is that for the labor movement and for social movements, for environmentalists, we need to find uh, technologies that fit with our conceptions of uh, decarbonization uh, being undertaken in harmony with <clears throat> aims of social justice. Uh, there are such technologies, many of them are small and simple, or as Dominic Cummings, uh, if you remember him, called it boring. Um, and uh, those technologies are not being used by governments in the way that they should be, whereas uh, techno fixes such as hydrogen are being promoted by the oil and gas industry and then taken up by uh, politicians. So that's the context. Uh, second uh, chunk is to just say something um, <clears throat> as somebody who uh, didn't get his uh, science O levels, uh, I'm just really uh, repeating to you what I've understood from uh, reading about the te technological side of this. So the first point about hydrogen is that for all this talk about the great hydrogen future, there is no talk uh, in the political sphere about the existing uh, hydrogen industry, uh, which produces a lot of hydrogen and produces an absolutely huge amount of uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, if you look at the graph on the left there, uh, the emissions produced by hydrogen production globally are not an awful long, uh, uh, not an awful way behind the amount of emissions produced by aviation. And I'm sure if we did a poll of uh, you know, people who are concerned about climate change, uh, e e even those who are quite kind of active in protest movements and so on, they would cite aviation as being one of the big problems. But I don't think they would cite hydrogen because it's, uh, it, it's not in the news and it's hidden. Uh, a lot of this, a, a lot of this. Well, the next slide is is about what this hydrogen is used for. But the other point is, it's it's called grey hydrogen. So the process is that you take natural gas, uh, which is uh, CH four, carbon and hydrogen. You take the carbon out and join that up with oxygen. You throw that into the atmosphere. That's called carbon dioxide emissions. And um, you uh, use your hydrogen for whatever you're going to use it for. And uh, what you can see that pie chart on the right hand side, most of this hydrogen is, you, is uh, produced from gas, some from coal, and all the so-called green and blue hydrogen, uh, which is all we ever hear about in the news, is represented by that tiny green strip at the top of that uh, pie chart. So that's the situation at the moment. There is an existing hydrogen industry, and it, again, it, you could either say it's nearly as much as global aviation in terms of emissions, or it's more than the UK and France put together. It's another way of looking at it. This is what this hydrogen is used for. It's used, uh, the, the biggest use is in oil refineries for uh, the various processes uh, that go on in those refineries. Um, it's used for ammonia production. Um, that ammonia is mostly used to make uh, fertilizers for agriculture. Um, that's the sort of use you might feel, you know, uh, was more deserved, if you like. Uh, so that's a, that's a significant use. Uh, methanol production, 
uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, quite a small amount in uh, steel production, uh, the light blue uh, segment. Now, what about uh, this blue hydrogen and green hydrogen that we hear about. I think just you know, looking at the audience on the call, many of you are probably aware of bits of this, but just to go through it. So you've got that gray hydrogen made from gas mostly or from coal uh, and the carbon dioxide, dioxide is a byproduct. And for every ton of hydrogen, don't forget, if you make it from gas, you get 10 tons of carbon dioxide emissions. I mean, it's a really filthy, dirty process. Now, Blue hydrogen is exactly the same, but uh, the idea is that the carbon dioxide will be taken away and stored uh, by a process uh, you, you, you've all probably heard of, carbon capture and storage. And you've probably heard of it because for 30 years, uh, oil and gas companies have been trying to make this process work uh, and they have basically not succeeded. Um, most of the uh, carbon capture and storage. There's a, there's a couple of dozen uh, plants around the world. Uh, there's only one freestanding one, I think, that uh, is not uh, related to the oil and gas industry and is working as well as was planned, but there are many more. So more than half the uh, carbon capture and storage that's done currently, the carbon dioxide is then taken by the oil company and pumped back into the reservoir to support the pressure of the oil and gas, which is then produced by that oil and gas company, uh, which is hardly a decarbonization uh, technology. Um, there's an, I mean, there are several other smaller ways and I'm not gonna go into it. And, uh, you, you know, we could have someone uh, who understands chemistry to go into more details, but the, 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 there's almost no hydrogen being produced in those other ways. The only other significant way that it's possible to produce hydrogen is by, uh, the electrolysis of water, uh, that so-called green hydrogen, and uh, all these inflated claims that are being made for the hydrogen industry are based on the idea that uh, that um, electricity will be produced by renewables and then that hydrogen will be available. But the problem is it takes an enormous amount of renewables to uh, produce green hydrogen. It's a very energy intensive process. Uh, you lose some, you, you actually lose something in the, in the process. So if you put in, you know, so many ter terawatt hours of uh, renewable energy, you get less, uh, you, the energy that's, um, that's contained in the hydrogen that comes out of the process is less uh, than what went in uh, from the renewables. And the problem about renewables is that uh, we are relying on them as probably the only really uh, properly non-carbon technology for producing electricity. And whichever way uh, the uh, energy provision goes, and under whatever set of social relations, electricity is definitely going to be part of it in the future. And what this slide shows is that if you've got a kilowatt hour of uh, electricity that's being produced from renewables, the first thing you want to do with it is to knock uh, gas and coal off the electricity grid and close down gas-fired and coal-fired power stations. And if you do that, you can, uh, with one kilowatt hour of renewable energy, you can get rid of two kilowatt hours of gas and then uh, so much uh, CO2 emissions, or two and a half or even three kilowatt hours uh, of uh, coal, and you can see that, 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 that there's a graphic representation there of how much uh, CO2 emissions you're then saving. It's a good thing. If you use that same kilowatt hour of renewables to produce hydrogen, and then you uh, replace your gas with that hydrogen, uh, you're getting a much smaller result in terms of saving carbon emissions as is uh, illustrated by that small uh, grey blob uh, down the bottom. Now, there's a last thing just quickly, and we can go back to this. Um, what we have particularly in uh, Yorkshire, where it is one of the areas that the government wants to use to test this hydrogen stuff out, and they've got this uh, so-called uh, carbon capture 
um, what's it called? Forgotten. Carbon capture sort of hub, which is going to be based in Yorkshire. But they're, they're, one of the things they're saying is that they're going to uh, also uh, bring into that uh, carbon capture project the Drax power station. They're falsely claiming that the Drax power station, because it's uh, being switched over to burn wood rather than uh, gas or coal, they're falsely claiming it as a great environmental victory. Um, it isn't. I mean, obviously plant matter does pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, but if you take the whole process, um, Drax is not uh, a green uh, power station. Uh, they're actually bringing the uh, wood at the moment from Norway in the most environmentally destructive way, spewing out a load of emissions just on the transport. Um, and the organization that has done some terrific research on this is Biofuel Watch and uh, very, very good to follow their uh, very, very good research on that. And uh, Drax is now saying that it's gonna be plugged into this uh, carbon capture and storage, the most ambitious project ever. Um, so far, the tests have shown that the, the equipment doesn't work as they want it to. And Biofuel Watch's take on this is that Drax's subsidies from the government run out in 2027 and they're trying to find a way of getting them extended and apparently uh, you, you, just saying that you're going to do something with carbon capture and storage is enough uh, to get you some more subsidies. Okay so uh, this is the third chunk looking a bit more closely at what are the possible uses and abuses of hydrogen. So there are things which if you think as as we tackle and confront this crisis we're going to have an industrial system that looks anything at all like the one we have now i mean personally i continue to hope that society is going to change the economy is going to change and we'll have a society and economy that looks very little like the one we have but if you think it's even going to look uh, a little like it you're going to have a lot of electricity and things like steel making, for example, are not going to stop, but they'll be, be very different and, and perhaps smaller uh, than they are now. And uh, I, I mean, I could sit and talk for hours, but Mike would stop me uh, about how you could use less steel in the economy and still everybody could live in perfectly comfortable houses and uh, could do what they need to do and uh, get from place to place and so on and so on and so on. And that's obviously, you know, all that is part of the discussion and the context, and, and we shouldn't try to discuss a particular technology, hydrogen, outside of the uh, larger context. Um, but if we're going to have an, a, a, an economy that looks anything like the one we have now, we may well uh, want, as a, and when I say we, I mean society, I do not mean uh, the government and uh, the capitalist ruling class. Uh, we as a society may well, well want uh, hydrogen, for example, to make steel, because um, it's got an enormous amount of energy per unit of mass. It's brilliant for storing, and you can uh, burn it at very, very high temperatures. So great for making steel. Um, but it is not great for low temperature heat. And uh, the big use of low temperature heat, of course, is heating homes. Uh, and, and it is also not good for transport fuel, and when I say that, I am merely citing a very uh, a recent report last month put out by the National Engineering Policy Center. Uh, they are not associated with the labor movement or the environmentalists. They are a, a, a very kind of mainstream establishment body of engineers. Uh, so they're looking at it from that point of view. And their point of view is you don't use this for home heating or transport you, because uh, to produce it from renewables uh, you, you need to use so much renewable electricity, you keep it for what you really need it for. And that might be making steel. Um, what I haven't done, and if anybody on the call knows, I'd be interested to hear, what I haven't done is got to the, got an understanding of whether there are other ways of making uh, fertilizers for agriculture, because again, you know, in the society I want, there would not be industrial agriculture on the model we have now, but I, I, I'm not sure that nobody would ever need some fertilizers. Uh, and I don't know whether it's possible to do those without hydrogen. But the point is, 
the hydrogen should be saved for what is really important. It should not be used for home heating. It should not be used for transport. And uh, Jan Rosano of the Regulatory Assistance Project, again, is quite kind of in the political mainstream and, and advises regulatory bodies in Europe as to energy policies. He said, uh, gas industry claims that clean alternatives to hydrogen for home heating are too expensive, too difficult and too disrupted. Those claims are overblown. And believe me, he's using very uh, sort of moderate language there. And in fact, he's the author of a paper that I've referred to on this next slide. And he reviewed 32 academic studies which compared hydrogen uh, for home heating and heat pumps for home heating. And how many of them said heat pumps were more efficient? 32 out of 32. Um, and that's it. We, we, we can find the, the link and circulate it to people that was in Joule, which is a, an academic uh, journal uh, for energy specialists. Um, si Simon, um, yep. I, I do not want to stop you, but I'll just tell you that you've used 20 minutes so far. OK, so, right. So uh, but don't don't stop. It's so good. Um, okay. I'll, 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 but I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, speed through. So, um, the, the, and that's again the National Engineering Policy Centre. The decision on the best use of available low carbon hydrogen needs to be made from a whole system decarbonisation point of view. Again, it, that's not me saying that. That is mainstream engineers who are working within uh, the establishment. And they've, they've got a diagram there, which again, we'll circulate these slides, shows how uh, heat pumps are four times more efficient. Um, if you use that renewable electricity uh, to, fire, to um, power heat pumps, you get four times as much heat as if you do it via hydrogen. Some of these studies actually uh, say five or six times. Um, right, next chunk uh, is the UK government. And just to say quickly, um, the Tyndall Centre, which is the country's leading centre of, or one of them, of climate research, has looked at the government's carbon budgets. Uh, I too often go to labour movement meetings in particular, where everybody says, hooray, the Climate Change Committee has got these carbon budgets, and they're going to try and uh, stand on the government's toes and make the government follow them. But when the Tyndall Centre looks at these carbon budgets, they see budgets that go only halfway to what's needed, halfway. Halfway is disaster in terms of uh, decarbonisation, and that's where the, uh, the Climate Change Committee is going and uh, where the government is not yet even going. So that's the context. And within that context, we have this hydrogen strategy where, as with other governments, the EU and the American government are doing the same thing. Uh, the government are investing in hydrogen um, in order to claim that they're taking uh, action uh, for decarbonization. Um, that's the wrong focus. So the point is not that no money should be ever spent on hydrogen ever. The point is that uh, we could have started in this country uh, decarbonizing uh, our homes uh, and providing heat from heat pumps any time since uh, the engineers began talking about that 20 or 25 years ago. That's never been done. Uh, there's been report after report to government. It hasn't happened. We could have uh, been decarbonizing the transport sector instead of uh, having a road obsessed and road centered transport sector that's never happened so the point is that this hydro it's it's not about hydrogen in itself although there's some things that are very damaging about the way it's being promoted it's about hydrogen which is being used as an excuse uh, and an alternative to uh, genuine decarbonization uh, policies so we've got the energy security strategy by boris johnson if you remember him uh, raised the target from uh, five to 10 uh, gigawatts of uh, capacity, half green, half blue. Uh, and to, uh, worryingly for the north of England, uh, two carbon capture and storage clusters approved, one in Merseyside, one in the East Coast. We can talk more about those. Uh, green hydrogen generation planned in Scotland. Uh, but we always have to ask about green hydrogen. Shouldn't that uh, renewable electricity be going into the grid. 
and you couldn't have a British political story without a bit of uh, cynical corruption. Uh, Centrica is in partnership with Rise uh, to do hydrogen. The CEO of Rise, Joe Bamford, is the son of Anthony Bamford, a big Tory donor and JCB boss. Uh, and uh, well, if this is going out on the internet, I suppose I'd better say, of course, I'm not suggesting for one second that those friendships have played any part whatever in uh, the government's attitude to hydrogen. Now, this is the most uh, pernicious and dangerous uh, project, uh, which will probably never happen because um, those engineers will keep saying that uh, homes are better heated by heat pumps. Um, but the, there is a project, it's still ongoing, to convert 15 to 16 million homes in Yorkshire in the northeast to, uh, from gas uh, for heating and cooking to hydrogen um, before 2050. This is really dangerous and uh, it should be opposed for the reasons that those engineers have said. And uh, the Leeds Trades Council, indeed, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, worked out its own plan, and I think this is an excellent example of the of the way we should be uh, doing these things in the labour movement. Um, it, it, they put forward their own plan for um, improving heat networks, district heating, heat pumps, and energy efficiency, which mainly means uh, insulating people's homes. Uh, there's that slogan you will remember: "Insulate Britain," um, and uh, this uh, proposal has been on the table. Um, uh, now, Ellen is with us uh, from Leeds, and uh, my question to her would be to tell us uh, what the response has been, because it's, it's, it's not been a, a, a really happy and successful story yet in terms of getting this to, uh, you know, get, getting a big movement going on this. And I think that's probably what we should be discussing. Um, greenwash is everywhere. That's on the slides. Uh, so moving on. Um, I, I'll end on this one. Um, suggestions for actions and policies. Um, these are just my suggestions of some starting points, which I think if we're going to campaign around these issues, uh, we could use. Uh, others will be able to uh, develop these. There should be a moratorium on hydrogen for home heating and transport. There's never a reason why uh, it should be used for home heating and transport until somebody shows why it's better uh, than the other uh, methods available. It should be a moratorium on hydrogen import plans that plunder the global south. We haven't talked about this, but there are outrageous uh, plans, particularly at European level, to uh, import hydrogen from African countries, uh, to import hydrogen from Ukraine, as though people there have nothing uh, better to worry about at the moment. Um, and that we should argue against uh, these sort of projects. We should argue, as Leeds Trace Council and many others have already been doing, uh, this is not a new one, more faster funding for insulation, heat pumps and training for engineers, uh, demand investment in public transport and non-car transport modes, that's what's needed for transport, and use life cycle emissions standards to combat greenwash. There's not a proper set of standards which tells you really what, what uh, technology is better than the other. And the labor movement and communities should develop holistic post-fossil fuel strategies that treat energy as a service and not a commodity. And uh, just, I've got a bit there about uh, the unions. Uh, I think union support for a hydrogen future is misguided and we should try to change it. Uh, I've got a fifth bit on um, the politics of technology, but I'll leave that and uh, perhaps we'll get onto the discussion. And sorry for taking uh, a bit more time, Mike, and thank you all for listening.